I'm going to get right into it and say when we found a body in the park. It wasn't what we expected to find. Now, every now and again, you're prone to find a body dumped in a park. I'm not saying it's the most common thing in the world, but when you're working around the state, particularly in bigger parks, these things do tend to happen. The body wasn't the strangest part of any of this, though. It was the fact that there appeared to be no reason for it. Now, allow me to elaborate. When the body was found, there were no marks on it whatsoever. There appeared to be no puncture wounds that would denote a drug overdose. No marks that indicated a fight. No bites from animals. Nothing. The most disturbing part of all of this, the smile. The woman's body we found wore a large smile. It almost seemed unnatural. That certainly isn't normal, and after some time, an autopsy was done and the cause of death was found to be unknown. That's right, they couldn't find a reason, not even by natural causes. It's as though the woman just laid down and passed away, leaving a messed up smile on her face as she did. That's impossible though, right? No one can simply will themselves to death right? Things get stranger from here though. A few weeks after the first body, a second body was found. The circumstances were seemingly similar. A body, a smile, and no seeming cause. Fast forward a bit and it comes out that this seemingly young, healthy man had the organs of someone nearing their hundreds. If you can't wrap your head around that, no worries. I'm still unable to make any sense of this strange happening myself. How does one have a seemingly healthy body, but their internal organs show that they are well beyond the age they appear? Curious, we started looking deeper into the area. Everything seemed fine. We'd had these parks open with no problem for decades. When we had seen no other deaths for a few months, we had become a bit more comfortable. Park goers were at ease, and we were confident that we'd seen the worst of things. It was sometime around mid-February when we would be proven wrong. One of our very own complained of being sick. They were having breathing problems, feeling dizzy, and were having some significant trouble hearing, among other symptoms. We took the employee to the hospital, and they ran several tests which seemed to indicate their organs were perfectly fine. They weren't sure why they were feeling how they were, but they recommended they rest for the next few days. A couple of days went by and the same worker we'd given a couple of days off now came into work with their hair completely gray. I'm not talking dyed gray, I'm talking almost completely white, as if they were ancient. Needless to say, she was more than a little freaked out, as were we. I sat her down and asked her about it. She explained she woke up one morning and it was like this. That said, nothing else seemed off and she was feeling better, so she wanted to continue work. We allowed it, but we watched her for a time, just to be safe. It was about May when things got truly strange. On a more personal level, there had been no more reported deaths and no strange sickness of any kind around the park. The whole thing was strange, yes, but we were grateful for some quiet. I had to work late, but I sent most everyone else home. I wasn't going to be doing anything crazy, just had some paperwork to take care of. So long story short, everyone went home while I stayed in the office and did some filing and finished some paperwork I'd been putting off as I hate paperwork. I was the only person in the station at the time this happened. I was working on my paperwork when suddenly the lights in the entire place began acting up. At first, it was a small flicker. That was followed by a sudden large surge of power and the lights going off and on. Eventually, they seemed to shut off completely. It was probably about 7 or 8, so there was still light coming in from the window, but it was waning quickly. I went ahead and checked the fuse box. Everything had been tripped. I checked to make sure nothing was wrong before flipping everything back on, and just like that, I had lights again. Sitting back down, I continued my paperwork for a couple of hours before the lights went out again. 
I was about to get up and check things when I heard a call for help. I will admit it was a little strange, but I figured I'd call out to see if I could determine where it was coming from, as I thought it was rather a faint sound. I called out, and then I heard screaming. Now, to describe the screaming would be to say it was pained. Though, whoever was screaming, or doing so from a semi-soundproof room or even the underwater. We, we, we don't have a lake anywhere near us, so that's really weird. I know it wasn't anyone in a lake. Still, I was perplexed and slightly unnerved, and as such, I tried to find the source of the screaming. I was eventually led to the front door of the station. I walked slowly toward the door and put my ear to it. It almost sounded as though the sound was coming from the other side of the door. As I looked out the windows though, I saw no one at the door, still putting my ear back to the door itself. I found that the screaming was indeed there, albeit muffled. I wasn't afraid at this point, or at least downright terrified or anything, but I did feel an unsettling feeling in my stomach. The kind you get when you're on the verge of being slightly nauseous. Almost like you know something isn't right with your body, but you haven't gotten completely sick or miserable enough as of yet to determine what the problem will ultimately be. Figuring there was only one way to determine the source of the mysterious sound, I decided to put my ear to the door again and listen. It was definitely still there despite the fact that my eyes told me different just moments before. I took a deep breath and opened the door. Upon opening it, I felt an unusually warm wind. It was May, yes, but this was more like a midsummer heat, and stepping outside everything seemed to almost slow down. As I stared around the station, I remember seeing what looked to be pollen floating through the air. I could still hear the screams, but they were becoming more drowned out by a strange, almost underwater sound. I clearly wasn't in the water. But the sound was distorted in such a way that everything seemed to be coming through in the same sound as if you were underwater. I walked forward, and that's when I noticed my movements were slower. It seemed as though time and also myself were barely moving. It wasn't long after that I began to feel extremely hot. I could hear faintly, see the outlines and silhouettes of people, but I couldn't make out who they were. Things became very bright. Bright enough that I had to close my eyes, but even then, it was bright. Too bright. I heard a voice calling my name, and then suddenly I was awake, feverish, and laying in a hospital bed. There were doctors and nurses standing around me, who looked very concerned. I was confused and asked what was going on. They explained I had a 104 fever and had flatlined not too long prior. They weren't sure what had happened, but... They had found me lying on the ground at the park by a jogger. They got me an ambulance, and long story short, I had been in the hospital for two weeks. I had been there for two weeks and had been unconscious until very recently. I was in shock. I could have sworn I had just been at the station, and it took me quite a while to even believe I had been in the hospital at all, much less for two weeks. I thought I was dreaming, and I kept waiting to wake up, but I never did. In the time I'd been in the hospital, I'd had every test known to man done on me. Ultimately, they weren't sure what was wrong with me. The thing is, is I'd been sick, but no test showed any signs of actual sickness, even when I was in a comatose. The doctors had no real explanation for any of it, and I even had fewer answers. I spent another month fully recovering from my supposed sickness, and I eventually went back to work. Since that day, I've never had another problem, and we've never had another problem at the park itself, with deaths or sickness under such strange and mysterious circumstances. I didn't appear to have any major aging signs, but something strange did happen out there. I'm not sure how to explain that strange thing or why it happened. I'm even less inclined to understand why all the strange occurrences stopped 10 plus years ago. I only know there are things out there for which we will never be able to explain. I work with the Washington State Park Rangers. I'm a male and about 40 now, but I was 25 when these strange happenings occurred. What happenings, you might ask? Well, it started pretty simply. 
I and a few of my co-workers have been told there were sightings of strange things going on in the woods of our parks. Sometimes it was tales of people believing that they saw a Bigfoot or something. Other times people swore it was aliens or ghosts. It was the usual tales, and these tales have been passed on for generations. There was always something strange going on out there according to the locals. Now I'm not one to demean people with such stories. I don't intend to with my story. I simply state the things I state with some sarcasm as, at the time of this story and leading up to it, I was a major skeptic. If you told me about it, I'd come up with all sorts of theories and natural explanations as to why this story was not true. Usually, I could completely explain away just about any occurrence you could throw at me. Strange flickering lights, well, you clearly have an electrical issue. Seeing ghosts, what'd you put in those brownies you were eating there, son? Aliens, probably just the military doing some sort of experimental flight test. Zombies, bath salt, more likely. Anyway, you get my point. I wasn't exactly a believer in much of anything supernatural or out of the ordinary. I've always found our world has fascinating and unexplained mysteries. Sure, but they all have an explanation, and even if they haven't been found yet, with logic, you can solve almost anything, eventually. So being the stubborn skeptic I was, my colleagues got together one October and thought it would be a great idea to have a little wager of sorts. We'd all get together and investigate the parks at night. We'd look for any and all manner of things unexplained or supernatural, and attempt to prove or disprove it. Now, in order to do this, we had to note any of the strange happenings around from our lovely locals. On top of that, we had to make a point to collect any strange experiences that had occurred to them, be it day or night when it happened. We took down all manner of things that sounded absolutely insane, but we kept professional and took it seriously. We had all kinds of strange occurrences. Ghosts supposedly roamed our parks. Bigfoot was definitely out there and he kept taunting our local herb man. Herb man, or men, when speaking of many, was what we jokingly called those we knew were very pro-weed and did quite a bit of it. The list went on for quite a bit and was every bit as amusing as it was creepy. Now, all that aside, what happened during the month is something even my skeptical butt can't explain to this day. Our first night of investigation wasn't all that interesting or entertaining. I think some of us, yes, more than just myself, were taking this as a fun activity that would lead to nothing. The first night, it was just that. The second night, though, was a bit weirder. On the second night, while looking for proof of Bigfoot, we caught Strange crying on our recording. Now, normally I'd have dismissed this as some kind of animal or audio interference in the woods, but this was also something a few of the other rangers reported hearing while out and about. We searched the area as the crying was happening. It sounded like what you would hear from a baby. Obviously, we didn't want some baby out there, abandoned or otherwise, crying without knowing the cause or being able to help. So we spent much of the night searching for the source. We never found it. This was compounded by the fact that as we searched for it, more than a few times it would get louder, and after rushing to find the source, it'd vanish and begin farther away. While everyone was perplexed, I still wasn't entirely convinced there wasn't someone out there messing with me and my team. I mean, it definitely wasn't some crying, super fast or teleporting baby. So that made the most sense. The third night we made a point of making sure the area was well equipped, monitored, and even blocked off to the best of our ability, as we wanted no pranksters to mess with us during our investigation. We went as far as to set up cameras in some of the trees or under certain rocks to monitor the area and catch anything we couldn't. It was late in the night. I'm sorry I don't remember exactly what time it was as it's been quite a while since these experiences. When we heard that same crying again. It was the sound of a baby and it was clear and distinct. Concerned something may actually be wrong, also irked someone might still be trying to mess with us, we decided to attack the sound from multiple directions. 
It was during this time that we all came upon the source from multiple directions. The problem was when we got there, everything was quiet. There was no crying, no sounds outside of nature, and no one could have been messing with us at this point. We searched high and low for a device of some kind, a mic or anything, but we never turned up anything of significance. The next day we checked out all of the footage, it was a Friday, and we turned up the sound, but nothing. The thing is, the sound would move, it would appear to jump from place to place, but no one could hear anything from the sound. Nothing was physically seen, and nothing was caught on the cameras. Figuring the weekend was coming up and intrigued by this mystery, we decided to spend the weekend camping in the park. We kept the area we had been searching cordoned off, but it was also an area people weren't really using for camping anyway. Most of those areas were further out and the noises we had been hearing seemed to be coming from the general area we had been searching anyway. Friday night nothing happened. Saturday night all was quiet. Sunday we all decided to go home, get some rest, but keep everything running overnight, just in case. Monday morning when we came in, we found the crying to be happening again. The sound on several occasions would appear in one area before going silent and seconds later the crying would pick up in a completely different area on the other side of the park from the first crying noise. I will admit, at this point I was intrigued and also at a loss for an explanation of any of this. Now Halloween was approaching and as such we would soon need to get the park ready for a celebration we were going to be having. So, we really only had another night or two to be able to set up properly and research what was happening. Deciding we couldn't do these things Monday because of schedules outside of work being fairly busy, we all decided to meet up the next day for a final push at figuring out what was going on in the park. Tuesday morning we come in to find the same noise again. Even stranger, this noise was heard in our own station at one point. No one has ever seen anything on camera, but the noise was definitely there. We kept our station monitored at all times and we do have sound to our security feed. Anyway, we were all excited for the night to come. I'll admit, I was even more excited than I should have been, and probably the most excited I've been in quite a while over anything strange or mysterious. I still believe there would be some kind of logical explanation, but I hoped we would discover it and be able to ease our curiosity and solve the mystery. Tuesday night came, and with it came the sound of a crying baby. We spent most of the night searching the area, but I had stayed behind in the station as we heard the strange phenomena there as well. The sound kept disappearing until I heard it in a room with me. It was very clear, very distinct, and I felt something in the room. I remember how cold things got, and I remember turning around slowly as my hairs were standing on end. The sound was so distinct it was as though I could hear it right from behind me. I felt a cold sort of breath and I heard a woman's voice. Help us, she said. I turned, and to my shock there was a woman dressed in a black dress that didn't appear to be anything from this time period. It looked like something straight out of the 1920s. She had a baby swaddled in her arms and she looked just like you or me. She didn't seem to be translucent. I remember stuttering and stammering. I wanted to ask her how it could help, but all I could get out was the stammering. I couldn't get words out. She asked if I knew of any way to quiet her baby. She seemed desperate and began to cry herself. She kept holding and rocking the baby, but it wouldn't stop crying. Then, just like that, the woman and baby vanished before my eyes. I didn't know how to react and I remember sitting down perplexed for what seemed like hours before I heard a knocking at the door that shot me off my seat. It was then I heard one of my co-workers asking to be let in. I had forgotten I had locked the door. I let them in and tried to explain to all of them what I had witnessed. I remember their hesitation to believe me, but at first, they felt like I was messing with them. Then we reviewed the footage and to my shock, the voice of the woman and crying were there, but they weren't visibly seen on camera. The entire crew looked around perplexed at one another before deciding to call it a night. Since this incident, we've done some research looking for this woman, but we found nothing. I'm not sure how to explain this moment. 
or the series of odd events that we experienced over that month. For once in my life though, I have no logical explanation and since these experiences, I become less of a skeptic. I do believe in ghosts, but I'm still skeptical of most of the stories as many can be explained by natural causes and occurrences. That night, however, that night still can't be explained at all. My story is rather short, but still unsettling for me. I worked for the park rangers for about five years before having to quit. The reason I felt like quitting was because of the strange occurrences happening around my workplace. There were odd lights at night and strange bodies found. I won't say where I was working as I'm scared if I do, something may happen to me. I know that sounds super conspiratorial and paranoid, but that's how I feel after everything. The first time anything weird or out of normal happened was in May of my first year on the job. A strange light was reported from the sky at night around 11ish. What was stranger was the next day we found a body in the same exact spot as the lights. The body was charred to a crisp, but nothing else around the body was burned at all. We're talking in the middle of the woods where a fire would have broken out easily. Strange as it was, things settled down for like three more years after that, before another incident happened. This one was on the anniversary of the first, and again, strange lights had been seen. Then, a burned corpse was left behind. I was weirded out, but still wasn't feeling threatened per se. It wasn't until my final year of working that I felt like I needed to leave the entire situation. I was working late to help out some of my co-workers, and for some overtime. If you've ever worked government work, you'd know, for someone newer and in general, Overtime is rare, and you should jump at that chance when you get it. Anyway, I was meandering the parks and helping clean up when I saw something terrifying. It wouldn't have been terrifying under normal circumstances, but considering the strange happenings of the previous years, this freaked me out. It was a light, a very bright light, and it seemed to beam down just over the hill ahead of me. I could see nothing else in the sky, just this beam. I ran toward the top of the hill, and when I crested over it, I looked down to see someone screaming. They were on fire and screaming, but, stranger still, there was no sound. I could clearly see them writhing in pain and screaming, but I couldn't hear a single word from them. I wanted to help this person, and ran down the hill as fast as I could. The light vanished and the person's body fully ignited in flames. I'm talking huge flames. The thing is though, nothing around this person was even slightly burned. It was now. I could hear the screams clearly, and I attempted to put the person out. I radioed to the station for backup and attempted to put this person out. Nothing stopped the flames. No matter what we threw on it or sprayed on it, the flame wouldn't recede. Eventually, it died out on its own after what I would assume was probably a good half hour. During that time period, this person arrived and screamed, but eventually they lay still, the fire continuing to burn until it stopped. The person was dead, obviously, but I remember being so shaken by what I had witnessed that I had quit that night. My department liked me and tried to keep me on, but I refused. I wasn't about to work in that area any longer, much less that job. Soon after this happened, there were reports of men in suits investigating the matter. I got a knock on the door and was asked about what I saw. Outside of that, nothing ever came of it. I told them I had no desire to go back to my job and I was done talking about what I had seen. The guys seemed like normal guys. They showed FBI badges and I have no reason to believe they were an FBI. Sometimes you hear about men in black and their supposedly strange air. But these guys seemed completely normal. Well, at least they did till the night my house was lit up by a bright light. I was at home. Actually, I was pulling into my driveway when it happened. It was the same light I saw burn that person alive. I immediately left the area, and I have since moved far, far away. I don't plan on ever going back to where I lived previously. Why would I since my house burns to the ground? I feel that the guys who visited me 
were probably FBI. But whatever burnt those things, the beam of light, I feel it was some sort of government weapon they were testing. You can call me crazy. You can call me paranoid. You can call me whatever. But I'm telling you, I know what I saw, and I'm damn sure I don't trust the government after that. I'm a man and I'm in my 60s. I work in Nevada with the state park rangers. Back in the 90s, we had a rush of unexplainable disappearances around our parks. These are things that were kept rather hush, but for which I'd like to share my experiences with you now. The first one was on the outskirts of our park. There was a man driving through the area around 10-ish. A camper reported seeing him and watching his truck stop near the entrance. Thinking nothing of it, he went back about his business. The next day, the truck was still there with no sign of the driver at all. There was no sign of struggle. No sign of anything, really. The truck was there and remained abandoned until it was eventually towed away a few weeks later. The driver was never seen or heard from again. No one tried to claim the truck. Nothing. A year later, in 91, a woman came to report her son missing. He had been camping in our park and was supposed to be home a few days ago. She knew where he liked to camp, and when he did camp, he took us straight to his site. We found a tent, some extra food, some shoes, the man's clothes, and everything looked relatively mundane, aside from not finding the man, of course. We searched for weeks and never found the man. Six months later, we had another missing camper. This one was supposedly seen jogging and screaming while naked before not being seen again. The next missing camper didn't occur until 94. This was a group of campers, though. It was a church that had summer camping trips. They had made them every year. Most everyone returned home, but it was noticed and reported that two of the counselors never made it back to the church. They had left with them, but had been following the church bus back in their own vehicle. Somewhere along the way, they lost them, but just figured they'd stop for gas or something and catch up. When they never came back, they were reported to the police who strangely found their vehicles in our parks, parked and with no sign of the drivers. This was stranger because the churchgoers knew for a fact that they had leapt with them. It was speculated they went back for something they forgot, but we never had anyone come in looking for anything missing during that time frame, and certainly no one matching the description of said counselors. The last missing person attached to the parks around our area it happened in 1998. This was a female college student that kept very close contact with her family, who on the last day of her camp out, didn't report in with her family. This naturally concerned the family, and while they tried to remain calm and rational about things, it didn't take them very long to contact the local authorities and our parks to report their daughter missing. The young woman's car was found parked in the same spot it had been when she started her camping trip. The area was searched and eventually her belongings in her tent were found abandoned. There was no explanation as to what happened to the woman, or any sign of struggle having been made. Much like the others who went missing during that decade, there seemed to be no sign of anything having gone wrong. It was as though they simply vanished into thin air. Now, normally, with these sorts of things, you'd get some conspiracy going crazy about aliens or something, but... There were never any strange objects reported in the area, or bright lights, or any of that during this time frame. At least, nowhere in the area where these people went missing. I'm a matter-of-fact guy, and I like to have hard facts before presenting any real theories. No bodies have been found in regard to the missing, and there's no evidence to suggest anything went wrong. As such, I can't even begin to speculate what happened to these people and my heart goes out to their families, as they have no answers either. I find these missing person cases rather strange, and while I have no way of knowing if they are linked or what is going on for sure, I hope the families can find closure one day. No matter what happened, no family should ever be without answers when something happens to a loved one. I've seen firsthand how agonizing that is for a family, and I pray for answers to come someday soon. I know there really isn't a lot to go with these missing peoples, but... I know there isn't a lot of information to go on with these missing persons, but 
If you have any thoughts about what might have happened, feel free to speculate. But I ask you to do so respectfully with the thought in mind of how you would feel if you were one of the family members. Anyways, thank you for listening to my story. My name is Jana, and I've been with the park rangers for some time around six years. My experience occurs in the Midwest. I'm not comfortable saying exactly where. About three years ago in December, the weather is very cold during the winter, and if you're working out in the wilderness, it can be very dangerous. We have certain people who like to camp despite the cold, and while we don't really recommend it, we still have to search for said people if they disappear. There was a man in his 60s who went missing late November and was reported as such the beginning of December. We had a general idea of where he was going, where he was camping, and we even found his campsite rather quickly. The problem was, things weren't as easy after that. We found wolf tracks and we found blood. We did not, however, find a body or any other sign of the man. At least initially anyway. The search continued for quite some time until one day, while patrolling, we found a human arm. The arm was being chewed on by a wolf which then ran off upon being approached. This was rather strange. The testing on the arm did eventually determine that it belonged, unfortunately, to our missing camper. The man had been presumed dead at this point and the search was already called off. Still feeling horrible for the family and being the type of person I am, I went off in search of the man's body. I drove back to his campsite and went off in the general direction we had seen the blood originally trailing. I realize this wasn't the wisest move, especially considering that there was quite a bit of snow following and worse weather expected later on. That said, I felt so bad for his family, and I kept thinking, if it were my family member, I'd want closure and potentially the rest of the body to bury, or at least answers. So I continued my trek until I heard something in the distance. I can't describe the sound other than to say it was loud and like nothing I'd ever heard in my life. It wasn't a wolf. If it had been, it would have had to have been the largest wolf ever known to man. The sound was so deep and unnerving, and the wind had begun to pick up. The snow whipping my face. I debated turning around, but I couldn't bring myself to do it, so I continued forward looking for any sign or hint of what had happened to this man, or more specifically, where the rest of him was. It was assumed the wolves have eaten his body or something along those lines. I wanted to find confirmation though. I needed to find bones or something more for the family. It killed me inside imagining how they felt. I've always been a caring person, and I've always gone well out of my way to help others. It's part of why I love this job so much. I keep stressing this so I can justify to you why I was doing what I did, as I know there are going to be a lot of people who may hear this story who are going to just think I'm stupid for searching for this man, especially knowing he is likely dead. Anyway, I continued my search until I found a cave. Turning on a flashlight I had brought with me, I searched the cave. His remains, or what was left of them, were sitting in the open in the cave. I knew where his remains were, and how to find them so I was getting ready to head back to get a better crew and maybe remove the remains when I heard what sounded like a loud and horrendous screech. I was startled at first, but I got my wits about me fairly quickly and began to head out of the cave. It was then I saw something I can't properly describe. It was massive. I couldn't even see the entire thing in the snow, but what I saw terrified me stiff. I felt an uncontrollable fear take my body and I went limp, crying and praying. I couldn't get my legs to move out of the shock of what I was seeing. Then I heard that loud sound again. It was then I realized it was coming from this monstrosity. The thing from what I can tell has flesh hanging from its bones, and some of it looked human. I wanted to get up, but there was nothing I could do initially. My mind was saying go, but my body wouldn't move. I kept thinking, if I don't move, I'm dead. Then I heard several loud howls and the thing appeared to turn its attention away from me. I snapped back to it and began running with all the might my legs could carry. 
I ran all the way back toward the direction of my truck. The snow was growing heavier and the wind kept getting stronger. I continued pressing on anyway and as I did, I thought I could hear the yelping of wolves. It sounded like they were fighting whatever was out there. After what felt like hours, I made it back to my pickup and got in, driving away and back to the station. I explained everything to my supervisor who understandably chided me before organizing a search crew to head back out and grab the remains. In the end, what was found was several wolves, some of which had been ripped in half, strewn all over the snow. There was a ton of blood in the entrails of many animals as well. There was no sign of the monstrosity I had seen in the wilderness, but I was grateful for that. I felt horrible for the wolves, however, as they were clearly all dead, and if it wasn't for them, I probably would have been dead as well. I have never seen anything so large or terrifying in my life. I mean, I didn't even see the whole fight, but... Crap, this thing had me shaking in my boots. It was easily the most terrifying and insanely unexplainable thing I've ever witnessed in my life. We were able to recover most of the camper's remains and the family was able to bury him properly. For that at least, I am thankful. I'll never get, nor do I wish to, the answers as to what that monstrosity was. But I can't even imagine the horror that camper must have felt. I feel he more than likely ran into this thing and not the wolves. Anyway, thank you for using my story. My name is Abigail, but you can call me Abby. I work for the park rangers in Arizona, and I've been around this work for roughly 20 years. It was probably five years ago that I first encountered what I call the eyes. Allow me to explain. I run a night jogging group during my off hours, and we do our jog through the park every Monday through Friday night. Well, once a year we get together on the first Saturday of June, and we do a big camp out to celebrate the anniversary of our group. We were all good friends after doing this together for 10 years. Some of our elder members had passed, unfortunately, but I was a noticeably young 30 at the time of this event. Anyway... To keep things shorter, I will just give you the highlights of the event. Basically, we did our run, then set up camp, told spooky stories, and talked about our lives, relationships, and any and all gossip we knew. We all turned in rather early. It was roughly 10pm when we went into our tents. I fell asleep quickly, and it was at this point that I first encountered this strange thing. I was dreaming. It was a dream so vivid, though that at the time I did not realize I was dreaming. I was out in the desert somewhere, and there was a man who was about 6'4", who looked to be a chieftain. He danced and spoke of things I had never thought about. He asked me if I wanted to know something about my future. I was going to say I did at first, but he warned me there was a price for such things. I asked him what that was. He told me something of equal value to the knowledge I would get. I told him I was willing to hear him out. He asked me once again if I was sure that is what I wanted to do. I told him yes, though I will admit I was beginning to feel very nervous. He said that I should cancel the next regularly scheduled run. I asked him why, but he said nothing. It was at this point I awoke. As I groggily sat up, I felt off. I tried to lay back down, but I just could not. When I went to did my business, it was shortly after doing so that I noticed something in the distance. There was a shadowy figure, and it was something I have dubbed the eyes. I'm not sure how to explain it, but I'll do my best. It was a black fur-covered creature that walked on all fours, very similar to a dog, but all over its body were eyes. I remember an assurance this is what is most strange about it. I felt an assurance, but it wasn't good. It was an assurance that came with a dread I have never felt in my life. I felt sick to my stomach at that moment and almost threw up. I then looked up to be sure I was not crazy, and the eyes still stared at me. After what felt like an eternity, it walked off into the darkness, and I could no longer see it. I felt minuscule. It was at this point... I felt I could move again and went back to my tent. I did not sleep the rest of the night, 
and I informed the ladies that I'd be canceling the Monday jog. When asked why, I just said I had plans that had come up that I needed to take care of, and that was that. Monday evening came and went, and I did not go anywhere. It was Tuesday morning when one of the ladies explained to me that her mother had a stroke, and she was able to get her to the hospital just in time to help save her life. This was strange, but what was stranger was her mother was the only person living with her besides her four-year-old daughter. Her mom usually watched her daughter for her on the nights that she went jogging. If she hadn't been home, her mom would have died, and who knows if her daughter would have been okay or not. Now, my first thought that it was probably just a coincidence. Upon that thought, I looked up and saw it again. The eyes. Standing next to this many-eyed dog-like creature was the chieftain. He nodded at me, which at this point I asked my friend if she saw anything out there. I kept my eyes on the man and the dog-like creature the entire time, but my friend said she could not see anything but the beautiful horizon. I did not push the conversation any further, and eventually I let it go completely. Six months had gone by, and I was now expecting to have a child. My husband and I were going to have a baby girl. I had not seen the man or the eyes in such a long time that I had honestly forgotten all about them. The next part, I have a really hard time typing. It was a Friday, and I was driving to work to pick up some things before I started my leave as I was getting too pregnant to continue my job. On the way, it started raining. It was not supposed to rain at all that day. I remember the forecast calling for clear skies all day and temperatures in the hundreds. I was almost at work when a truck swerved from the oncoming lane and headed right for me. I had no way to slow down or stop, so we hit head on. I remember feeling out of my body. It was a strange feeling. I heard voices and I was not sure what was happening. That's when I saw them. The man, the eyes, and a little girl with a glowing aura. I remember feeling that dread again when the realization hit me hard. That was my little girl. I do not know how I knew, or why that was the first thought I had, but I just knew. I remember shaking and screaming. Then I saw the girl blow me a kiss and tell me she loved me before the man and the eyes walked away. I couldn't understand it. I could not understand why this happened. Eventually I woke up in the hospital crying. It had been a week since my crash, and I knew already what the grim faces on the doctors were about. I cried every night and quite often still do. I do not know what to say besides that I am still in shock, and it's been years. I think it's important to know that while I can't come up with a great explanation as to what these two things were, or why things turned out the way they did, but I can say that my husband helped me through everything, and we are still together to this day. I can also say, as sad as the story is, we now have a little boy named David. He's the most precious thing in my life, and I let him know all the time. If you share this story, thank you so much. Growing up in Texas, I've always been a pretty chill dude. I did my time in the military, came home, and the first thing I did was my schooling before laying my position as a park ranger. I'd always loved the outdoors, which I'm sure was no surprise at all for anyone who's ever been a park ranger or grew up in Texas for that matter. The exception being if they were raised in the weird place that they call Austin. City slickers will never understand the life in the country, and why it's so appealing. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with enjoying your life, how you want to enjoy it, be it in a city or in the country. It's just that life is a lot more peaceful in the country, most of the time. I will say in the case of this story, life was not as peaceful as I'd like it to be. You hear a lot of local legends around here, but I've never heard of any legend or tell. That would have prepared me for what happened to me in May of 2001. A big part of my job is to simply survey the area. It isn't anything wild, but you get some of the most peaceful and awe-inspiring looks at our beautiful earth and our wonderful country. It was while working on a Friday that I first encountered something that I would deem strange. I was on one of my patrols when I thought I had seen something out of the corner of my eye. It was a brief flash. That was there for probably a second before fading. Now, it was enough to get my attention. 
and so I headed in the general direction of the flash. About five minutes later, I come upon the oddest thing. There is a symbol emblazoned in the grass. It's fairly large, and I don't even know how to describe it outside of saying, when looking at it, it felt immediately wrong. There was a dread that filled you when you looked at this thing. I wasn't sure how it was caused, but I figured I'd go ahead and keep a watch over the area and eventually write up a report. The next day I come back, yes, I had to work the weekend. This is where things got a little weird. When I returned to the spot with the symbol, it wasn't there. There was no distress, nothing. Okay, I thought to myself, that's a little strange, but it wasn't the end of the world. So I put it out of my mind and went about my day. Fast forward to about 3 in the afternoon, and I hear screaming. I head in where I'd heard the sound from, and I arrived to find a woman, and what looked like to be maybe a 7 year old boy freaking out. I asked, what's the problem? And the woman informs me that they saw some sort of large, black dog come through the area, and in an instant, it snatched a raccoon up, broke it open with its teeth and vanished off into the woods. The woman seemed more unnerved that her son had witnessed it, but when asking about how big the dog was, she said it was about her height, and massive. I remember chuckling for a moment before asking the woman, how big was it really? The woman just stared at me with a dread that said that she wasn't making this up, and she wasn't amused by this question. It was then that I began to take her a bit more seriously, and made a report, and I promised to keep an eye on the area. So that's what I did. I watched the area like a hawk. I waited, watched and waited some more, until my shift was up. I never saw or heard anything. I did find a trail of blood that led off to a point, before it became too hard to follow. After a while, due to varying factors, one of which included the land itself. It started in the area the woman and her son had seen the thing in, and likely was that of a raccoon that meant its unfortunate end to a huge dog. I put up a warning about the large dog at the office and eventually I went home. I returned to work on Monday, coffee in hand and ready to make the most of another beautiful day. It wasn't long before the day took a strange turn. As I came to work that morning, I saw something near the office. It was a dog, a black dog with teeth, like that I've never seen before. It was massive and snarled at me. As I walked closer to the office, I stopped and tried to hold my hands out, doing my best to calmly tell this thing that I was no threat. The thing grew quiet and quickly turned around and bolted off in the opposite direction. I took a moment to recollect myself and made sure I hadn't pissed myself before moving to the office. As I stepped closer, I noticed an awful stench. Rounding the corner the dog had been standing, I found a deer that had been torn open. I spent a good chunk of the first part of my day cleaning up the mess, and soon after, I put out a warning about this dog. I didn't want anyone running into this thing for any reason. I spent the remainder of said shift on the lookout for the thing, but I never spotted it. Fast forward a few weeks, and I got a call late one night that the police had been called to the park as a result of someone calling them. Apparently the person was scared and crying over the phone, but they went silent and by the time the police arrived they only found a torn jacket and some blood. I came out and had a look around, and discussed things with the officers in charge at the time. He recommended we shut the park down until further notice. I told them that likely wasn't going to happen, but I'd see what I could do. Speaking with my superiors, I was told to run a day and night shift, until the thing was found and taken care of, or the sightings had stopped. I agreed... This was stupid, but it was out of my hands at the time. So I ran a day and night shift, with the help of local law enforcement as well. Mostly all I really did was have myself and a few volunteers switch to nights, along with some of the officers. And during those nights, we searched for this big old dog. It didn't take long to find the thing. While searching alongside one of the off-duty officers, we heard screaming this was subsequently followed by gunfire. We rushed towards the sounds and found a man who looked shaking and still pointing his gun. The dog wasn't there, but 
there was blood. The officer spoke with the man and I rushed off after the thing. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I wasn't even sure what to do since all I had was a knife. But eventually I found the dog laying on the ground and growling, but unable to do much on account of the bleeding. I called the officer and informed him that I'd found the dog. He said that he'd be right over there, and it wasn't more than a couple minutes before he arrived at my location. Raising his gun, he watched the dog while I held the flashlight over it. The thing didn't seem right. Its teeth were massive, and it was highly aggressive. I'm quite sure, if it hadn't been incapacitated by the gunshots, it'd be after us. But for the moment, it couldn't move anywhere. We decided we'd call animal control, but as we were making the call, I turned to see this dog get up, growling once again. I swear to you, I saw this thing's wounds heal, slowly before my very eyes. I've never seen anything like it before, nor since. It barked three times before a whistling was heard. I turned and looked, but I couldn't see anyone. The dog's attention was fixated on the whistling, as it rang out again. Just like that, it bolted out of sight. It moved faster than I'd ever seen any animal move in my life. It was there, and a few seconds later, it vanished into the night. I'm not sure what this thing was. I'm quite sure it wasn't a normal dog. I'm still rattled and intrigued just thinking about it. We kept the night shift rolling for another couple of months, just to be safe. We never saw this dog again. Sadly, we never found the person who called 911 either. There was no trace of them, and to this day we can only assume the worst. You can call me Brent. It's obviously not my real name, but I thought I'd share a story about my experiences with a man to ram one of these parks I run in North Carolina. Now I am coming up on retirement, and this happened roughly three years ago. At our park, we regularly have issues with squatters. We constantly have to run them off in the early hours before the park officially opens. Also, we have armed security patrol at night to keep them away from any of the legitimate campers. Now, I have a bit of a soft heart, so I do not love running off people. I must though, as a lot of squatters are druggies who leave needles and other things lying around the park. There is one man though, who we like to refer to as Hobo Jim. I promise you this is not offensive, as this is what he tells us to call him. Hobo Jim is a kind soul, and he was not one of those druggies. In fact, he would often observe nature, and when we would ask him to leave, we would actually just ask him to find a bench and look like he was enjoying the park. The man was smart and had a love for nature that was pure in my opinion. I would have pretty long conversations with him on my break, and we had hit it off well anytime we'd talk. I once offered him a job, but he would always smile and say I do not need your work. There was a reassurance behind that smile to this day that still warms my heart. So one morning I come up to do, you know, my normal patrols, get things ready to be open. I'm in the station and that is when I see him, Hobo Jim smiling as big as ever. I said, how's it going? And he simply smiled some more before waving and walking off. I remember going inside the station and getting some coffee started shortly after this. All the while, thinking to myself that I should see if Hobo Jim wanted some. So I headed out the door and looked around but did not see him. I then shouted his name and got no response. I went back in and figured he would show up later as he usually did. It was about five minutes later that I was startled by a frantic knocking at the door. I rushed open to find a woman and a little boy who looked terrified. They explained they were attacked by a heavier set man. They then explained that I needed to call 911 and without hesitation I did. I motioned for them to come inside and relock the station. I had them explain to dispatch what happened to them. It was then I heard the conversation and realized what happened. The heavier set man had attacked the mother and her kid. He had shoved the mom to the ground before trying to beat her when he was attacked by none other than Hobo Jim himself. Hobo Jim scrapped with him before the man pulled out a gun and shot him point blank in the head. While he did kill him, Jim had managed to stab the man in the ribs before his death. This bought the mom and her child enough time to get away. 
the paramedics had found both men dead at the scene. This isn't where the story ends, however. A few weeks go by and suddenly, I get a visit from Jim's attorney. He informs me it was in the man's will to leave me what he had. As it turns out, Hobo Jim was not a hobo at all. He was a lonely older man who enjoyed experiencing the world around him and liked living simply. He had roughly 20 grand to his name at the time of his death, and he left it to me. Now this isn't life-changing money by any means, but the thought that he left it to me as a gift, and the fact that my friendship with him meant that much to him that he would give me that money. I took a good chunk of the money and put it back into the park itself. I'll never forget Hobo Jim, or the selfless act he performed in his last moments. So wherever you are now, Jim, I hope you're smiling, my friend. I will not say my name here, but you can call me Tyler. I'm a 35-year-old woman who has been working with the park rangers for 15 years now out in Alaska. My story is going to be rather brief, as i always been rather matter-of-fact about these things. I've never been much of a rambler. Several times a year, I see something I cannot explain. It is a large humanoid figure with black eyes, pale skin, and massive, inhuman-like teeth. I see this thing off and on, usually in the winter. It is not something I like seeing, nor is it something I can fully explain. This thing is roughly 13 feet tall, but it's built like a tank. Every year we have issues with animals being found torn in two, or certain populations drastically reduced. The thing is though, I don't think one thing is solely responsible. I believe there are many of these things out there. My reasoning for this is that I've seen different variants of this thing, if you will. There is a giant behemoth looking one I see most often. There are some that seem to walk on four, possibly six legs, and there is even one that flies through the skies late at night. I do not have video or photographic proof of this, but I mostly bring this up because I was wondering if anyone had ever seen anything like this. I'm not just talking about Alaska. I mean, anywhere at all. I am at a loss for words as to what these things could be. I am firmly of the belief that they are some sort of undiscovered cryptid of some kind. From what I can tell, they never seem to bother humans as we have never had reports of people going missing or winding up dead like these animals we sometimes find. I apologize if this is not much of a story, but I just wanted to explain the strange creatures I have seen, and I just wanted to ask if anyone has seen anything like these things. My name is Robert, and I no longer work with the park rangers, as I've long since retired. I am 80 years old now, but back in my days as a park ranger in Colorado, I came across a bit of an unspoken local legend of sorts. Up in the mountains, we see all sorts of animals and other things. Well, if you go up there late at night, you may find a woman. She wears all white and constantly cries for her baby. If you go up at the right time, you will often hear it late at night. Well, well, while walking along one night, I had an encounter with this woman. Sure, as you can believe, she stood before me the same way anyone might have if it were bright as day instead of night. She had a glow that was eerie and beautiful in the moonlight. I was doing a bit of camping at this time. I was on vacation when this happened, and she stood there crying, weeping. I had always heard the legends, and while I believed they were possible, I never took them seriously until I saw her for myself. She cried and cried, looking for her child, but I could not help her. Cold with dread, I watched as she disappeared before my eyes, her crying slowly fading away as she did so. This is not the oddest thing I have seen up there in the mountains, though. There is also a strange group of people who wear skulls for masks that often gather up in the mountains at night. I've encountered them once, and had the good sense not to be seen at the time. They were dancing in robes, and seemed to wear the skulls I speak of. I'm not sure how else to put it, and I'm guessing they were some sort of cult. There have been reports of people missing in the mountains, but I am not sure if the missing has anything to do with this group, 
or simply unfortunate circumstances, something I have not seen personally, but I have heard spoken that some have seen UFOs in the area. Strange lights and odd sounds also happen. In fact, I feel Colorado is a pretty happening place when you consider many of the things myself and other locals have witnessed here. One final thing I'd like to make a comment on personally. It is something that of all these things I've mentioned, I find the strangest and most terrifying. There are strange cries that happen in the mountains. I'm not speaking about the woman crying for her child. I'm talking actual full-on screams of terror that happen frequently near where I used to work. It usually happens randomly through the night and is almost a nightly occurrence out there. I live close enough to the park. I can hear it out in my backyard from time to time. It's not an animal. No. It's very loud and very distinct. These screams of terror have no real origin or source. They just happen out of the blue. There was a man a few years back that swore he could find the source, but after many attempts, he never did. The last time he went up there though, he was never seen again. We searched for him, but no one ever found him. No one filed a missing person report either, as far as family and such go. So eventually, the search was dropped. I know how crazy this all sounds, but I thought I would share it with the uns anyway. I'm in no way saying that the man's disappearance had anything to do with the screams or any of that. I'm just saying, there are plenty of disturbing and creepy occurrences around these parts, and if you would like, I can share some more sometime. July through September is considered the fire season in the western United States. Because of the summer heat, most of the vegetation dries out during this time, creating the perfect opportunity for a raging wildfire. One flick of a cigarette or one loose campfire and the whole forest might go up. I don't know if you guys have ever heard about the fires that have been raging all over California and in parts of Utah. The last I heard, the one closest to me in Utah, about not more than 10 miles away, is less than 4% contained. Because of this extremely wild fire and the difficulty the firefighters have found in containing it, most of the canyon roads have been closed down. My state has been lucky though at least none of us have had to evacuate our homes like those in California have. I can't imagine losing everything in a fire that could have been prevented. I would be so bitter about it. But Utah has suffered in other ways. The air has already notoriously bad in Utah County because of the surrounding mountains making it impossible for total air circulation. It's even worse with the fire burning. Smoke constantly hangs in the air, and my entire home smells like a campfire. The local authorities have cautioned parents of young children to keep them inside as much as possible to avoid breathing complications. Authorities have also warned everybody not to enter the canyon for any reason. They say the fire is too dangerous as an uncontrollable at this time. Additionally, the local fire departments and ranger stations have been so overwhelmed that a few weeks ago, they began asking for volunteers. My boyfriend, James, signed up almost immediately with two of his friends. He has always wanted to be a firefighter, but the ranger he signed up with assured him that he would not be anywhere the actual fire. Instead, he would be completing and filing paperwork that the rangers were too shorthanded to do themselves. James was assigned to a ranger station up the canyon and would work shifts like the actual rangers do, three days on, three days off. The first few times he went, he told me it was really boring, but he loved doing anything that he could to help Ben who was bigger than himself so he planned to go through training to become a real firefighter later this year. 
Secretly, I was glad he was bored with the paperwork. That meant he wasn't in danger. But I knew trouble was coming when he came home in an excited rush after one of his regular three-day shifts. He told me that they had asked him to be a part of the crew that brought food and drinking water to the firefighters currently stuck up in the canyon with the fire. Of course, he accepted, but I was very angry with him. He should have talked to me about it first. I had a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach when he told me that he was going. I felt something bad might happen to him, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. All I could do at the time was wait. I'm also still quite a bit worried about the events that played out after his trip, and I need some advice or maybe some help explaining him what I saw. James was to report to the station on August 1st and complete a mandatory training exercise that lasted two days. After that, the crew would go further into the canyon and locate the firefighters to deliver their supplies. The total trip would take five days and he promised me he would be home on the night of August 7th. He wouldn't have cell phone reception, but there was a satellite phone that he could use in case of an emergency. Those seven days were the worst of my life. I couldn't sleep because of worry, and I tortured myself with Google searches on the statistics of yearly firefighter deaths. I kept reminding myself that he wouldn't be fighting the fire, he was only delivering supplies to the firefighters. But when the clock ticked 12 a.m. on August 7th, the night my boyfriend should have returned home, I launched into a frenzy of panic. I called the local fire department and the local sheriff's station in town, asking for information, but nobody could give me anything. Most people didn't even know about the trip that the volunteer crew had taken. My sister came over to stay with me and it was great comfort having her with me, but it didn't change my worry or distress. On August 10th, three days after my boyfriend was to return home, I was living in a daze. Time passes slowly, or not at all. I took work off in order to cope with the stress I had encountered, and I was convinced my boyfriend had died. I was only waiting on that cell phone call to confirm it. While Google searching more annual firefighter deaths, a notification popped up on the top of my screen. It said, Photos from James' iPhone have been successfully uploaded to iCloud. I quickly clicked on the notification and began to cry. I knew James kept his phone set to manual uploads, meaning he would have to initiate any sort of upload. Maybe he wasn't dead or fatally wounded after all. But as I scrolled through the pictures that he had uploaded, my heart began to sink even further than it had sat before. There were five photographs that had been uploaded, but before I could click on them, I got a phone call. It was the chief of the fire department calling me to inform me that James was okay, thank God. They had run into some trouble with their vehicles, and that's why the trip had taken three days longer than expected. James was currently being treated for minor cuts and burns at the hospital, and the chief told me I could come and get him. I flew out the door and sped down the road. I was so relieved. My heart was pumping so fast, and the 39-minute drive to the hospital felt like a millisecond. I stood in the door and saw James there. He stood to hug me. He apologized for scaring me and told me he wished he hadn't left me and uh, I forgave him instantly. I was just happy to have him home safely. I asked him what happened and he said he couldn't remember. The doctor then stepped in to explain to James that he had a combination of altitude sickness and smoke inhalation that caused a form of amnesia. It might also be due to the extreme stress and shock. The young doctor also told me the lack of sleep could be to blame. In short, James's doctors did not know what caused his short-term amnesia. I was told James might regain those memories from the trip he took, but he also might not. They assured me 
that James had passed all other memory and psych exams, and that from now on, he should be fine. James and I had spent the last few days at home, and I helped him recover. I tried to help him piece things together in his memories, but for now, it just seems useless. He couldn't remember anything. It wasn't until yesterday, August 15th, that I remembered the notification I had received. I hoped that the pictures James had uploaded could help jog his memory. So I pulled out my laptop and logged into our iCloud storage. The five pictures had all been taken on August 5th, a few hours between each one. The first thing I noticed was that all of the pictures had a neon tint to them, like a filter had been placed over them. The colors of the flowers and leaves were very vibrant, and this stuck with me because it was quite odd. I remind you that it's fire season and the vegetation should be dried up. The first picture was a close-up of an insect on James's finger. It looked like a ladybug at first glance, but closer inspection revealed the bug had eight legs and it was kind of greenish. Rather than regular circular spots, they seemed to be octagon shaped. The next picture was of a grove of trees. It seemed average enough, but you see the trees weren't like regular trees found in this area. I had never seen anything like them. The roots had been pushed to the base of the trunk, several feet from the ground, almost like long, spidery legs. I zoomed in closer on the picture to see that one of the trees had several different kinds of leaves growing from one branch. Pine needles, oak leaves, shrug leaves, even a few tea tree leaves. The third picture was of a deer that was green-like in color. At first, I figured it had been a Photoshop or something like that. But after a closer inspection, I found the amount of time it would have taken for the shading and tinting would have been enormous. It was impossible that that photo could have been retouched. I was also surprised and disgusted to find that the deer had three sets of antlers growing from down its spine, and that one of its hoofs peeked out from under the brush had four claws. That they almost, they, they were just so, I don't know, I can't really explain. They almost resembled like switchblades. Since then, I've done some background searches to see if the photo had been retouched, and I can't find anything similar to it at all. The fourth picture featured a tree trunk that had been scorched, but rather than sap pouring from the open wounds in the tree, a thick, red liquid similar to blood in color and consistency seemed to pour out. This picture Although the least surprising made the hair on my arm stand straight up, the tree was, in fact, bleeding like an animal would. The last photo was actually a video. The thumbnail was a raging fire. I looked at James and his facial expression told me that he didn't remember anything. He asked me if I was messing with him and his voice shook when he spoke. He was sweating, and I could tell he was distressed. I apologized for pressuring him to remember, and helped him into bed. Later that night, I watched the video alone, and it was horrifying. The video, about 30 seconds long, was filmed from behind a bush and was obviously been filmed on a handheld device, as it was extremely shaky. The video depicted 15 or more men in hazmat suits, Wielding flamethrowers. They sprayed the flames all across the trees, and even onto some animals that had been trapped in the inner circle. The footage was neon like the pictures had been. The trees and creatures in this video looked strange too, like they had been morphed and changed into something otherworldly. This video convinced me that the photos hadn't been retouched or meddled with. The cost of the equipment alone to produce a video with such realistic looking creatures would be well into the hundreds of thousands. Most disturbingly, as the creatures burned alive, their squeals sounded like... It just... 
They sounded like humans. The fire raged, and its roar was deafening. When the video ended, I, I just sat staring at my computer screen for a very long time. It seems that these fires, at least the one that James had documented, weren't the product of a loose campfire or a rogue cigarette. They seem to be intentional. They're containing something. They're killing something. Forests are large. I mean, that goes without saying, but it's not something you go out of your way to think about. Around 31% of the earth is covered in forest. Thick trees reaching into the sky, just enough room between them for people to fit, almost like they desire to be explored. 31% doesn't feel like a large number. That is until you find yourself lost in one. Then the expanse of the forest feels infinite. There is a magical appeal to that wooded infinity, much like how you'd look over the sea and wonder what creatures reside at the bottom. I looked into the woods, seeing through increasingly small sight lines as the trees stretched on and wonder what those trees could be hiding. I suppose that's why I started working as a park ranger. I liked how the mystery inspired me to think outside of my comfort zone. You'll hear so many stories in your lifetime. Whether you're roasting marshmallows around a roaring fire, or polishing off some beers in your buddy's basement, someone is inevitably going to try and scare someone else. Chances are, one of these stories will take place shrouded in darkness, deep in the forest. Tales of unassuming hikers falling victim to an angry Bigfoot, or any other collection of cryptid. Mysteries of people vanishing without a trace, only to be found miles away in some impossible location. The forest isn't mean, nor is it kind. It just is. I started a job as a park ranger a few years ago, and have since seen many things that could be weaved into a story around the fire. Strange creatures lurking just out of eyesight, Odd vanishings with no real explanation to them. These are the kinds of things you typically avoid reporting. Reports without substantial evidence or cause are thrown into a desk somewhere, without hesitation. If there's nothing that can be done about a case, then the higher-ups don't want to be bothered with it. Even when it comes to missing cases, you would be surprised how often someone goes missing and the paperwork is shuffled to the side. It took me months to convince anyone above me that we needed to set up trail cameras that we would be able to stream to a control center. It was a solid month of going to work and walking the trails to find local wildlife had been mutilated. I would come across carcasses visible from the trails that would appear to have their stomachs ripped open. The organs would be poured around. Only the bones of the animal's ribcage would be missing. For the entire month, this would happen nearly every day. Sometimes, I would even find multiple bodies. It was always the same thing, gutted with the ribcage missing. I saw one of the most impressive bucks I'd ever seen, ripped apart like it was a chew toy. Large and prideful antlers had been snapped, fragments of them laying around the body like snow. It was upsetting to see, such a pride creature reduced to ribbons. It got to the point to where I was screaming in the face of anyone that would listen. We had trail cameras up, but they were old and would only activate when they sensed motion, saving the footage to the camera itself. They were outdated and inconvenient. Whenever I would review the footage from the trail cameras near discovered bodies, there was never anything to see. Sometimes, at best, a blur would pass by and the animal would scurry off but it was impossible to make out what it was. As if finding all the dead animals wasn't enough, when everyone was found, there was a pattern of destruction in the area, almost like a trail leading to the deceased. There would be deep grooves dug into the bark of trees. 
The grooves would have a dry substance that looked like molasses, but felt like rubber. We sent the substance off to a lab, something I was surprised was being paid for, but the results were always inconclusive. They said it was blood, but couldn't explain the unusual properties. There would also be several deep pockets of dirt dug into the ground. They would sometimes be deep enough that I could stand in them and have the surrounding dirt be at the level of my knees. It wasn't until I had to spell out the obvious that they started listening to me. When I positioned that if something was able to mutilate animals that evolved to survive in the woods at such a pace and remain undetected, then just imagine what it could do to visitors. Visitors equals tourism, tourism equals money, and people can't spend money if they're dead. Furthermore, no one wants to go to a forest where people are being found gutted like they got their autopsy prematurely. Another few days went by, another few bodies found. Two rabbits were found laying directly on the path by some visitors that arrived right as we opened. Luckily, the mother was able to divert her child's attention before she spotted the gruesome end. That would have been a potential lawsuit for sure. I assured her that that was unusual, lying through my teeth, grinding a grin. I told her that I would see to removing it. It was after cleaning up and heading back to the small shack I call my headquarters so I can feel more important that I found a brown box sitting on my desk. Running a knife through the tape and lifting the cardboard flaps, I was pleasantly surprised to find a healthy number of new trail cams. They were green rectangles of validation. They almost looked too fancy, and there were so many of them. It felt impossible to think that park services shout out the money necessary for them. My requests for much cheaper amenities have gone unanswered or outright denied multiple times. But here I was, with a box of around two dozen trail cameras, ones I hadn't even seen on the market during my research. Just looking at them, though, they no doubt fetched a pretty penny. I was thankful for the diligence I demonstrated during the month. On the wall of my headquarters, I had a general map of the forest, and decorating that map was an assortment of 50 or so red X's. Each X was the location of a dead animal that was found gutted with ribcage removed. I also had small lines that showed the scarring of the trees leading to the animal. Along with this box was a small one that opened and revealed a small metal box that looked like a VCR. Quickly figuring out that it was a server that the cameras were going to stream through, I hooked it up and decided the best place to put the cameras was putting them where the victims were clustered together. It seemed pretty sporadic, but there were spots where the X's got denser. I decided to use 12 cameras to observe the areas where clusters were, making sure to try to get decent angles. The other 12 would be placed further away to try to create a kind of perimeter around the site. It took a while to get done. Multiple times I would have to travel back to headquarters to double check my work. I wasn't a fan of being out there when the sun was going down, but I was close enough to finishing that it didn't make sense to stop. When I had finally placed the last camera, I started heading back to the main trail when I heard a rustling quickly circle me. I didn't catch sight of anything and cursed myself for not setting up the servers so the cameras I just put up were recording. Not wanting to mess with anything that could splice open a creature five times my weight, I hurried my pace and got back to the cabin. Well, I mean headquarters. Placing the server box on the desk, and hooking it up to the computer and monitor that could have easily been a hundred years old. I clicked through one camera after another. I was, I was startled when I clicked through the cameras and found a deer staring right into the lens of one, its eyes glowing a piercing green with the assistance of the camera's night vision. It was admittedly pretty cool to watch the amazing wildlife walking around in real time, just doing what they do. Although, as I clicked through the cameras, it became apparent that having just one monitor was an issue. The time it took to cycle through 24 cameras left way too many blind spots. I could display multiple cameras on one screen, but eventually, the pictures would get too small to see anything. After an uneventful night flipping through cameras, one image blending into the next until they became one blur of green and gray, I headed home. 
Before heading in the next day, I grabbed two monitors that were sitting around my house, and then another that a friend wasn't using. I got to work and did my usual rounds. Either there wasn't an animal carcass this time around, or I just wasn't able to find it. Checking all the cameras with the benefit of the bright sun beaming through the trees, I took notice that none of the cameras had a logo on them. There was nothing to identicate the brand or model, not even a serial number. It was odd for sure, but I wasn't in any position to bite the hand that fed me, especially considering they permitted me to stay in the headquarters overnight, which was highly unusual. I couldn't help but feel my superiors were being held on a tight lease by someone. The day went on agonizingly slow, but eventually the tourists started to disperse and the sun started to dip. Beams of sunlight sifted through the forest, casting their final breath as the sun dropped below the horizon. With stars dotting the sky, I prepared for a long night, throwing a blanket over myself and turning on all the monitors. It wasn't a perfect setup, but I had enough to have one of them displaying one camera at a time that I could flip through. The rest of the monitors had eight different cameras. The program allowed me to set hotkeys, so if anything caught my eye on the screens, I could type the camera number in and switch right to it. I felt like some kind of FBI agent trying to capture a drug mule. It felt honestly pretty cool doing a stakeout on something I had a hand in creating. An hour or two went by, flipping through cameras, when I first caught sight of something odd. It was quick, but out of the corner of my eye I saw, on one of the monitors, that something had walked by. Looking at the map behind me, now with numbers next to the red X's, I tried to figure out what camera would catch the blur next. I saw that camera 13 would lead into camera 16, if whatever it was continued going the same direction. Then I typed in the camera number and sure enough, in the distance, I could see a figure moving towards the camera. Sitting up I focused in. Finally, about to see what had been causing the wildlife so much grief, the anticipation faded into disappointment as the figure got closer and revealed itself to be a person. With a sigh, I leaned back into my chair, frustrated that I had gotten my hopes up over some wanderer. Never liked dealing with people who are in the park after dark, but with whatever was running around, I couldn't risk just letting it go. I reached over and grabbed my flashlight. As I was standing up from the chair, I felt the ping of deja vu. The sensation was just enough to keep me from taking my eyes off the screen. I recognized what he was wearing. The gray button-down shirt tucked into his pants that were either brown or green. I could never decide. But it definitely was a park ranger. What the hell? I whispered to myself, observing the camera. I briefly thought about who was scheduled to work. I knew for a fact that the only other ranger that was doing any final walk of the park at this time had been gone for two hours at least. I had seen his truck pull away, and the only car left in the parking lot was my own. Wondering what another ranger would be doing out here so late, I held off on going to confront them. The other ranger bent over and placed his hands on the ground like he was doing something, his fingers sifting through the dirt. It wasn't the best quality, but I was able to see him curl his fingers and plunge them into the dirt. Pulling his arm back, he clawed up a mound of dirt before repeating the process with his other hand. He continued doing this, picking up pace of his digging. I watched pixels of dirt flying behind him. As he dug deeper, I couldn't help but wonder how his fingers weren't hurting. Night can make the dirt pretty cold and coarse, honestly. Just as that thought crossed my mind, I felt a sting developing on my fingertips, like hundreds of tiny pins pressing in. Lifting my hands, I felt the flashlight I had been holding slip out of my hands. The thud of it hitting the floor was followed by the sound of dirt hitting the hard wood. Looking at my fingers, I was perplexed to find that they were now caked in cold dirt. A dark brown was now present under my fingernails as the stinging sensation grew more painful. Quickly wiping my hands on my pants, dropping the layer of dirt off, I was able to see small abrasions foaming on my skin. The stinging stopped and I was compelled to look back at the screen as the park ranger started walking off camera. It took a few clicks to find another camera that was capturing him. 
Eventually, I came across a camera showing him, showing his face. Uh, I could barely comprehend what I was seeing. If it wasn't for the dirt still lingering on my fingers, I would think someone was trying to prank me. It wasn't exact, but the face of the park ranger, it was me. I was standing out there on camera, on a live feed. My chest started to tighten as cold washed over me. Here I was standing out there in the cold, with no jacket on. I could feel that chill running down my arms. I could even feel the pulse of the wind that I could see pushing the foliage around. I think I was saying something out loud, but I was so enamored that I couldn't remember what I was saying. I watched myself on the live feed looking around. The way my neck moved around was quick and jittery. I could almost feel my neck muscles starting to ache. Lifting my hand to put pressure on the sore spot forming on my neck, I watched stunned. I looked like an animal out there. The way my head moved, I could imagine a noise catching the doppelganger's attention, causing him to look in his direction. He lifted his head, as if finally getting a whiff of what he was looking for. Using the same type of quick movements, my copy dropped to the ground again and started digging vigorously into the ground. The icy cold of the dirt wrapped around my fingers once again, but this time, I could see it happening. The dirt was just appearing out of nowhere, painted onto my fingers as if by some invisible brush. My jaw clenched up. The cold was hurting more than the rough dirt until the pain started to dissipate. Once it felt like my fingers were starting to go numb from the cold, I was mortified to find out why their numbing was necessary. The copy of me walked over to the tree that was still in view of the camera, and much like the dirt, he dragged his fingers across it. I couldn't feel anything at first, but he did this again and again, placing his fingertips on top of the bark of the tree and dragging them across like a dog trying to claw through a door. I held my hands up so I could watch the doppelganger and my fingers at the same time, so I could watch my fingernails splinter and chip away slowly. The numbing helped me, but by the time I could see my skin starting to split open, thin trails of red running from open skin, the pain was starting to override the cold. Behind my fingers I could see him continuing, unfettered by the pain, clawing deeper and deeper into the tree. Eventually, well through the bark, I could see sections of the skin on my fingertips starting to splinter and fall off. By now, the trembling had gotten so bad my hands were almost a blur. The numbing the cold had offered vanished, and all that was left was a dragging, phantom agony. Blood and skin coating the rest of my hand and wetting the dirt. The doppelganger only increased how harsh his actions were, and I started seeing bone underneath the flesh. I started falling backwards. The pain was now running through my whole body. Nerve endings desperately telling me to stop what I was doing, but I couldn't. I just had to bear it as the tips of my fingers were sanded away until I could only see white protruding. My mouth had become so vicious with saliva that it was hard to get my screams out. Each inhale nearly drowned me. Falling to the floor, even the bone started to transform the more rounded tips were being dwindled. The pain never really stopped, but the bones became pointed like spikes. I could tell the dragging had ended. It was a struggle to get up, my fingers still on fire, and mangled to a point that I could no longer use them to brace myself. Trying to do so caused exposed nerve endings to scream on contact. Finally, back on my feet, I saw myself lowering his stance his eyes glowing against the night vision, a predator ready to pounce. Looking at the map, I could see the direction his attention was. Camera 5. My exposed bone hung over the number on the keyboard. I had to see what was going on, what was going to happen next. With a heavy breath, I ripped the band-aid off and pressed down on the key, switching the camera, but also sending a shock through my system. I shivered from the sensation, but I was right. I could see my doppelganger, and more importantly, the buck standing in front of the camera. He was so fast, 
The version of me on the screen was so eerily quick that the camera struggled to keep him in focus during the pounce. My copy flattened his hand and shot it forward like a spear, piercing the skin of the buck. My eyes nearly rolled into the back of my head, feeling the echo on the impact. The other hand was soon to follow. One hand retreated and the other went in, alternating over and over again. I don't know how much longer I could take, what I could do to stop it, maybe turn off the TV. What, what would help me? I don't know. Soon enough, the buck fell over. It barely seemed to put up a fight like something had paralyzed it. My copy bent over, using the holes it had already created and pulled open the buck's stomach. My body must have gone into shock as the sensation didn't seem to reach me. As expected, he reached into the buck and started pulling out whatever organs were in it. At least, now I would find out. I would know why that ribcage was the only thing taken from the animals. With a strength I knew I didn't have, my doppelganger reached into it with a snap, retrieved a bone. I could feel my arm muscles tense up as he was pulling out bone after bone. Bizarrely, he lifted two of the larger looking ribs and placed them on top of his head, almost mimicking horns. Then seemingly satisfied, he put the bones in his mouth and started to chew on them, just like my fingers. I could feel bits of my teeth flack off and the rest of my tongue and gums as he ate the bones. The act of eating them started making my teeth ragged, replacing the pearly whites I had before with mangled fangs. It didn't hurt much until the teeth had broken to the point that nerve endings were showing, and it was like a pain I've never experienced. It shot directly to my brain and had me buckling to the floor. That was it. I couldn't take it anymore. As the echo continued eating one bone after another, I couldn't tell if the sharp cuts running down my throat were from the shattered teeth or the sensation of the copy swallowing broken bones. Before the copy could finish though, my body had enough and against my will, my eyes shut and the world went dark. I woke up in a hospital, slowly snapping back to the world of the living. The hum of overhead lights ushered me in. A cursory movement of my tongue revealed that what I had experienced wasn't a dream. I instead had a smooth line of teeth. Uh, I felt jaded and twisted teeth more suited for a predator. Moving my fingers, I could still feel the sting of the wounds. I could tell that the bones were still exposed, pointed fingertips that were more like weapons now. Even my skin had taken on a pale complexion. The doctors informed me it was because of dehydration and a deficiency of calcium. No matter what I ate or drank though, over the week I spent in the hospital, my skin never shifted a shade. They kept me there as long as I could, but they said, other than my teeth and fingertips that rejected any skin grafts, I was healthy. In fact, I was more than healthy. My muscle mass had increased and brain scans showed unusually high brain activity. Everything in the hospital, I could hear it all, smell it all. Every sensation that I took for granted before was amplified. I could smell a blood test from the other end of the hospital as if I was a shark. Something happened to me. I'm different now. That night changed me. From what I've heard, the instances of animals being gutted stopped that night. I think of that night often now. Nothing seems to satisfy my hunger. Nothing is quenching my thirst. And more than anything, there is this nagging sensation that has been growing. It's at the top of my head. It feels like something is trying to grow there. Every time I focus on the sensation, I am reminded of my doppelganger, placing the rib bones on top of his head. I thought before he was mimicking horns but I think antlers would be more appropriate. Much like how you'd look over the sea and wonder what creatures reside at the bottom. I looked into the woods, seeing through increasingly small sight lines as the trees stretched on and wonder what those trees could be hiding.